Clark Kent is in Metropolis, working at the Daily Planet, falling in love with Lois Lane, and he has a dual identity. Is it all falling into place? Is it all going perfectly? <laughs> Doomsday is coming. Welcome to Durbania. I'm Durbin, and this is my theological review for Smallville Season 8, The Twisted Heart of Man. And I call it that because this season has a very interesting theme. Clark is working out how to balance his Kryptonian side with his human side. As he has this dual identity, he's looking for the best in humanity, and he has his number one rule, never ever kill. And that rule and how he views humanity is severely put to the test this season. Maybe you haven't been put to the test yet. Maybe your island's still out there, Clark. Is his island still out there? Does he arrive at his island, his crucible this season? Let's talk about season eight. If you like this type of video that I do, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and share this with a friend. I'm a true believer in this red and blue super dude. Hello. Can I count on you to publish that letter if anything happens to me? I have to see you. How do you feel about phone booths? Let's say midnight. Smallville season eight, traditionally, it is my least favorite season of the show. But this last time I watched it, I had a little bit of a conversion. I think it's because as I was watching it for the first time as it aired and the episodes are popping up week to week, it just felt like it was taking forever to get places. Especially since we already had Clark at the Daily Planet, falling in love with Lois. He's got the dual identity going on. I was just like, make him Superman already. And so airing week to week, things going slow. I was getting impatient, like just let him go forward and let him step into the light. And I felt like they were holding him back. And let's not forget, this is a season with new writers. We don't have Michael. No Rosenboom, no Lex Luthor, no John Glover. So there's this completely different feel over season eight. So I think that was my problem the first time I watched it. But now re-watching it to do these reviews, first watching it with the purpose to review, it kind of forces you to watch it through a different lens and with a different set of eyes, which I think is a good thing. And it definitely was a good thing for me this season. Back in the day, the stuff I previously found cheesy this time watching it, I found it as an invitation to not take it so seriously and to relax and just have fun with it. Because that's what the show is supposed to be. Superman is a little cheesy. And so being able to do that and have more fun with this season, it was fantastic. On top of the fact, this season really did, I think, have a good balance and had a good balance between the dark and the light. Like the whole first half of season eight was very light, very fun, very cool building the classic Lois and Clark. But then you had Doomsday and this sense of impending doom. And because they did Doomsday a little bit different, there's a different philosophy behind that character, which is deep and interesting. And so it was this great balance between the lighter and fun elements and the darker elements. And I feel like it worked together very well this season. You're looking at the newest recruit to the Daily Planet. That's great. So just first up, it was a blast having Lois and Clark finally together as a reporting team this season. And I love how he tells her like how he's starting at the Daily Planet. And then as he's walking away, she looks at him with this little smile on her face. And so I feel like right out of the gate with Lana gone, like saying goodbye on that stupid tearjerker of a DVD. <laughs> with that now completely out of the way, we have this base that has been built since season four between Lois and Clark, and now they are building on that. Don't tell me I have to wear a tie. Always dressed for success. No time for the men's room. Let's change in here. A phone booth is not exactly Where private. Where's daylight hours, Clark? None of it feels contrived, none of it feels forced, and none of it is angsty because they have this incredible solid foundation that has been building since season four. And now that Lana is out of the way, it's about having fun with that relationship. These are two strong independent people, not incredibly weak, whiny, codependent people. And because of that, they just like each other, they respect each other, and then that begins to grow where they just really want to be together. And I love what, like, especially episode two. Episode two to me is just classic Lois and Clark. Because first off, you have Lois hilariously giving Clark all the rules of how to be a reporter. Rule number one, always know your source. Rule number two, always make a good first impression and don't screw up with the boss. I think that's two rules. 
whatever. And what's even greater is later in the season, he took those rules and he had them framed. Wow. Who would have known you were this sentimental? And then you have those moments where like the bus explodes, she turns her back and he runs off. And there he is being like Superman and he's ripping the top off the bus. He's saving people. And then you have those moments where Lois wants to get close to the bus, but the cops won't let her. But Clark kind of standing aside, listens and he gets the information that Lois is striving to get. So it's this classic Lois and Clark stuff that begins to build and it starts to make things really feel like your classic Superman story. It's not quite there yet, so it keeps that Smallville feel and it has that epic feel that you know it's building towards the future we know is coming but it's a great way of building it. In fact, the whole Lois and Clark relationship is so fun that one of my favorite episodes in the first half of season eight, you have Jimmy and Chloe. They're engaged and they get married in the middle of the season, but while they're engaged, they get kidnapped because it wouldn't be Smallville without something asinine like that happening. The fun part of this episode though, is Lois and Clark pretending to be engaged in order to get kidnapped so they can find Chloe and Jimmy and rescue them. What are you two doing here? Uh, tell them, Cupcake. Lois and I are... We're getting married. <laughs> the point is, Lois and Clark are a great team. And this is what the show has been missing this entire time. And it's like, now finally, they're a team. And it's so fun to see that grow and to see how these two people begin to care more for each other. And Tom Welling and Erica Derns have such a great chemistry on screen together. It just works. And it's so fun to watch. Sitting here now with you, I think I'm more proud that we uncovered the truth than I am over having a headline. <laughs> The other thing is just watching Clark grow this season. So it opens with the fact that, you know, the fortress has collapsed and Jarrell took away Clark's powers so that the Traveler could not be controlled by Lex Luthor. The fortress collapsed, Clark gets rescued, and then to get his powers restored, Martian Manhunter flies him towards the sun, which restores Clark's powers, but takes away Martian Manhunter's powers. So no Jarrell guidance, no Martian Manhunter backup, no real safety net, and we see the choice that he makes to be a hero. There's this great montage uh, a little bit later in the season where you see him running around and just saving the city. And it's this great montage because we see the choice that Clark is making. That Jarrell's not there to guide him, but he still wants to step into his destiny. Yeah, he's still overcoming certain fears and stuff in his life, but we actually see Clark mature and grow leaps and bounds this season as he's making the conscious choice to save the city. Without a doubt, I'm officially a true believer in this red and blue super dude. In fact, Clark Kent becomes the blur this season. Now I've seen people with mixed feelings about this and I have mixed feelings about it because calling him the blur is actually kind of weird and cheesy, but it's a great episode where Jimmy Olsen snaps a picture and Clark in super fast mode catches Lois and saves her from a car about to hit her and he, gets a blurry image on the frame. And what's so great about that episode is the hope that Clark sees. So first off, this episode proves Jimmy Olsen is the smartest of all the characters because he put together really fast that the blur is Clark Kent. No, it makes perfect sense. It's you, isn't it? Freaking genius. He's also later on finds out Davis is the serial killer Freaking genius. But the point is Clark trying to throw Jimmy off and say, look, I'm not, I'm not the blur. Why would you ever think that? You have Oliver Queen dressed in a red cape and a blue outfit trying to repay what Clark did for him in season six when Clark disguised himself as the Green Arrow. So now here's Oliver Queen trying to help conceal Clark's identity. But when Oliver Queen saves Jimmy and Clark looks around and sees just the hope and the inspiration on people's faces, it inspires him. So yeah, maybe the name, the Red Blue Blur, is cheesy, but I think the concept is very cool. And then even cooler, as you're watching Clark grow and mature this season, when Chloe's in trouble because Brainiac has infected her mind and he's erasing her memories, Clark rebuilds the fortress with the crystal to save Chloe. And listen to what Clark says to Jarrell. One thing needs to change. You call me your son. You treat me like your enemy. I think it's time you stop punishing me and start trusting me again. You've grown up, Carmel. Your trials have matured you. So even Jarrell 
notices the maturity in Clark, that he has grown leaps and bounds already. And so really that whole first half of season eight, watching Clark grow, watching Lois grow, watching Lois and Clark grow together, it is a ton of fun. And it feels like they're really building the classic Superman stuff. And it feels like I'm watching a lot of that classic Superman stuff. And I absolutely love it. And it all comes to a head at Chloe and Jimmy's wedding. And it's just this great moment where these two who absolutely belong together, this is a relationship we should care about. They build it without angst. They build it without annoying teenage drama. They build it so strong and firm. And finally, they're moving in for that kiss, this ultimate moment of payoff. And then, no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Now, before I go on, I want to read to you a comment that one of my viewers, Rebecca, commented on my season seven review about Lana, because I feel like Rebecca, she hit the nail on the head. Listen to what she had to say. I feel like in trying to give Lana something to do this season, it was at the expense of Clark's character growth. And I 100% agree with that. And I think season eight illustrates 100% what she commented about season seven, because the moment Lana shows up, it's like this pause button pause on all of clark's excellent growth pause on this awesome relationship building between lois and clark pause on everything so that for five flipping episodes we could give lana a proper goodbye she didn't need a proper goodbye you know what her proper goodbye was season three when she went to paris she should never have come back really what this pictures for us is how bad Lana is, not just for Clark's growth, but how bad she is for the show. Like her character is a dead weight around the show. And so season eight has all this forward momentum, pause. And now it's like we take all of these steps backwards. And it's really irritating to me because what you have is Lana Lang, who apparently decided that she really just wants to be super, just like she was in season seven. And that drove me nuts in season seven. It's one of my least favorite episodes because what you really see is how entitled she feels she is. She feels like she's entitled to those powers, entitled to those abilities. You live with these abilities every day. I think I can handle it. To the point now where she goes, well, I just wasn't mentally and physically prepared. But I wasn't ready for them, physically, mentally, or emotionally. So she hunts out this Green Beret guy to be trained so that he could torture her and train her how to withstand it so she's mentally prepared. But then what's worse is she decides the training is over. How does she decide that? I don't understand how someone can have so little self-awareness. This guy knows exactly what he's doing. He knows when the training's done, but no, she decides the training is done. And why does she decide it's done? I need power. I just, I, I seriously, I can't, I can't stand it. I can't, I can't freaking stand it. It is beyond irritating. She just wants that power. And in her mind, that way she's on equal ground with Clark and she's not a distraction to him. And now they can be together. But really the show shows us what this relationship really is. So here she steals this technology Lex Luthor was working on, this like nanotech skin suit that mimics the powers of her Kryptonium. And so they give this power to Lana. The show tries to tell us how much she deserves that power, especially when we have the Legion visit and this little interaction with Lana. You sacrificed so much for Clark. is hide out on some farm. You're remembered for a lot more than just your relationship with kal -El. You have a destiny all your own. As much as they wanted to say she has a destiny all to herself, she never guest stars again. There's never a newspaper or a news headline talking about some superwoman, some other part of the world. She does nothing. Anyway, she gets this power and really Lex, being the way he is, made the suit so it absorbs kryptonite. So he sets up this giant kryptonite bomb, which by the way, this is hysterical. Clark, I searched every room and I can't find the bomb anywhere. Look at the size of that thing. It's freaking right there on the roof. How do you fail to go to the roof to see that? Point is, she gets up there, touches the bomb, absorbs every bit of the kryptonite. So now she's kryptonite infected and Lana and Clark can't go near each other because she is poisoned to him. This literally becomes a picture of what their relationship is. It is dysfunctional and it is poison. It was poison to the show itself. It's poison to Lana and Clark. I mean, constantly, every time they're together, they're filled with angst. She puts the weight of the world on his shoulders and he's not innocent. He puts the weight of the world on her shoulders. It's just this weird, unhealthy thing. And finally, the show has given 
given us the true, honest picture of how bad that relationship is when she's covered in kryptonite and she's literally poisoned to him. It's incredibly irritating. And what's worse, <sighs> It was just so over-the-top cornball. It was over-the-top cheesy. Probably one of the smartest things it did is it took Lois out of the equation during those four episodes. And I wouldn't want Lois to be in that position because it's just annoying teenage drama angst. And so finally, I guess they decided we had to say goodbye to her and we got her off the show. It's done. It's over now. <sighs> And then how you know this goodbye was kind of pointless and just press pause and everything good that was going on is because the very next episode hits unpause as if none of that Lana drama had even happened. It picks right back up with Lois and Clark and building that good stuff it was building before we went into this little five episode reprieve. But I will say, here's one of the good things that came out of those five episodes. We are the Legion. We've come from the 31st century. Hey Cal, where's your cave? Cave. And this is an interesting introduction because it is kind of funny to see the Legion coming back from the 31st century and meeting Clark and they're having some disappointment with his character. I mean, one of the reasons is this right here. No glasses, no tights, no flights. So far, he's nothing like the Man of Steel. Not only do they have that disappointment with him, but it's the fact that Brainiac is supposed to have been dead on this specific date. Now, this is something very interesting they do with Chloe. Because one of the ways season seven ended is Chloe had that healing power and then Brainiac tried to do his like brain thing to her and her healing power came out and you have this great moment. What the hell are you? But that was laying a foundation for what was to come. I mean, I love seeing her brain be like a supercomputer because it really, it fits her. It fits her personality so well. But it's also a really good picture of the devil, how he wants to come as that angel of light. And so he came as something that fit her personality so well, but it also made her comfortable with Brainiac's presence because Brainiac was alive in her mind and he began to take over her brain. And then there was that interesting episode where he began to erase her memories one by one. The purpose of that was to fill her with fear and leave for her only the memory of Davis Bloom to drive her and Davis together, which is really to drive Brainiac and Davis together so that Brainiac could begin to fulfill his plan with Doomsday. And again, seeing Chloe as Brainiac is very, very interesting. Chloe Sullivan ceased to exist the minute she entered this fortress. I'm the brain interactive construct. Like she does a great job in the role. And I love kind of the exposition she gives as to what is Brainiac's plan with Doomsday. After I've drained this planet of all the human information, Doomsday will annihilate what's left. And I love her delivery of those lines. She, I'm glad she's not a villain because she's such a beloved character, but I love seeing this because it's like, I could see Chloe as a villain now. So possessed with Brainiac wearing that bloody wedding dress and her black eyes, she really is a very terrifying version of Brainiac. But it was very interesting how they continued Brainiac, continued his genius and continued his deception and laid a foundation for Brainiac 5 all at the same time. Because part of where the League is disappointed is Brainiac is supposed to be dead. And so they need to kill Chloe, the vessel of Brainiac, to once and for all kill the interactive brain construct. But Clark refuses. And he, he realizes, yes, I get it. Brainiac needs to be destroyed. And if they are from the 31st century, he has to, he has to destroy Brainiac. And he gets that, he wavers for just a second. And I'll give Lana credit where credit's due. She says this to Clark. But the Clark I know would never doubt himself. Lana. He would never waver. He would insist that he could save Chloe's life and the rest of the world. And it's a great reminder as to why Clark believes what he believes and he makes that firm stand. No, we will preserve life at all costs. And they perform that epic digital exorcism. And that lays the foundation for Brainiac 5 when the Legion takes him back to the 31st century. So that's actually very cool in a very cool way that history was fulfilled and Brainiac was defeated and Chloe was saved. But it also sets up the interesting philosophy again of the build up towards Doomsday. Clark's Island, his crucible, it's still out there. 
but Clark believes with all of his heart, preserve life at all costs. Preserve life at all costs. That will be the number one rule in Legion code from now on. Looking for the best in humanity. I love this line between him and Oliver where he talks about setting a good example. My responsibility is to do what's right. Like it or not, we stand for something. We set an example for others to follow, and if we don't, then we're no better than the people we fight. Now, Clark has this strong heart, and he has this strong commitment, but part of season eight is that buildup to that being tested. And Doomsday is that buildup. Like I said earlier, season eight has a very good balance, a very good mix of the fun, lighter elements along with some of these darker elements. And Doomsday is definitely that darker element. Doomsday is coming. To me, the philosophy that he represents is this, John 10.10. 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now that is the sole purpose of Doomsday. It is the sole purpose for which he was created. And his creation is interesting. Fiora says his purpose best right here. You arrived here as genetic matter, containing our planet's most powerful life forms. You would evolve to become Earth's ultimate destroyer. Our family is meant to take this planet as our own. Now, I find that interesting. Clark and Lois, they get sucked into the Phantom Zone for like half an episode. But what's interesting is, is one Phantom gets released when Lois gets released, and that is the wife of Zod. She possesses Lois Lane, and that's where we get that epic line and that epic revelation that really Doomsday is the son of Zod, but genetically created to be a destroyer so that the Earth could be wiped clean and belong to the family of Zod. So he fits every bit of that description, the thief, to steal, kill, and destroy. And because Doomsday is created as this creature to evolve, he's virtually unkillable, as is said in Batman vs. Superman. But they had a great build-up to that throughout Season 8. Like Fiora, the first way she makes him evolve is she runs him through with that pole in the hospital. But when he gets stabbed, he heals, and he becomes, like, pretty much unbreakable. You can't break his skin like that anymore. I think what's most interesting about this interpretation of Doomsday is you have the character Davis Bloom, a character who believes he's human. So you have this human side railing against what he's created to be, which is the destroyer. And so he has these metamorphoses into this monster, which is really the next step in his evolution. And when he becomes the monster, it goes out to complete its nature, which is to destroy and leaves a trail of carnage. And so he tries to look for redemption and he points the beast at bad people, hoping that will calm the beast. And of course he finds no redemption there. He finds no freedom there. So he turns towards Chloe, having a huge crush on her, thinking he's in love with her, that that will calm the beast. And so he seeks to possess her as an object and holds her emotionally hostage. And when these attempts for him to control his nature fail, he believes the lie that there's only one way out. So he gets a hold of Chloe and they go to the kryptonite cage from season seven and so that he could end it all with kryptonite. But what's amazing here is Clark Kent showing up to bring light into his darkness. Chloe, pull the lever, let me end this. No, Chloe, you have to give this another chance. This is not set in stone. We should have been brothers. And yet Davis, like, the monster begins to break out, so Chloe hits the switch to save Clark, and it rains liquid kryptonite on him, and it looks like it kills him, and he seems to die temporarily, only to come back stronger, impervious to kryptonite. I'm immortal. So they do a good job showing us how Doomsday evolves and becomes a stronger and stronger weapon. And even through the process of that evolution, we see Clark Kent with his firm commitment that he wants to save Davis Bloom. So as long as Davis has his old nature, he is a slave to its desires and its passions and its destiny. No matter how hard we try to fight it, we will always return to our true nature. What Davis needs is a new nature 
altogether. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Doomsday impacts each of our characters, and I think Oliver Queen has a very interesting character arc, because I feel like season eight, it begins with him in a very bright place. I mean, Clark is missing after the fortress is destroyed, and he is out there searching for Clark, and he won't give up because he knows Clark won't give up on him. Clark would never give up on us. We're not giving up on him. And he goes into a darker and darker place throughout season eight until finally he kills Lex Luthor. Toy Man tries to kill him and using one of Toy Man's toys that was a bomb, he sends it under this truck that Lex Luthor is in, blows it up, and he is responsible for the death of Lex Luthor. And you can almost see that once Oliver Queen has crossed that line, he feels like it's easier to cross it again, especially when looking at Davis. He's like, destroy the whole thing, Clark, like what he says here. How many more lives are you willing to sacrifice if your plan fails this time, Clark? So it's interesting since Oliver has already crossed that line, Davis Bloom is a great fear for him. It's something that he really has no power to defeat. And so he's telling Clark, you need to kill. Not everyone's worth saving. We need to take care of Davis Bloom. So Clark devises a plan to use black kryptonite, which separates the Kryptonian from the human. He wants to separate Doomsday from Davis Bloom and save Davis and banish Doomsday to the Phantom Zone. But that's not enough for Oliver Queen. He can't handle the what if. And so using a kryptonite shock arrow incapacitates Clark as he and the rest of the Young Justice League go to try to take matters into their own hands and kill the monster and the man. Don't worry, Clark. I won't kill you. This just get your ego out of the way so we can do what needs to be done. And this also leads to Tess Mercer, who it's interesting because I feel like the first time I watched season eight, I didn't like her. And it's because I didn't let myself like her because I missed Lex Luthor. I missed Michael Rosenbaum the first time I was watching season eight. I was just so sad to not have that Luthor dynamic in season eight. But this time, just allowing myself to enjoy season eight and just having the right expectations, I really enjoyed this season. And I found Tess to be a fascinating character. And I think what makes her more fascinating is the latter part of season eight because she gets that journal from Lionel Luther, the Veritas journal. Through the Veritas journal, she learns the true origins of Clark Kent, but also the true origins of Davis Bloom, like how he came like as a piece of DNA or something attached to Clark's ship. When it crashes, it takes that form of a human, its first stage in that evolution to blend in before it grows up to become this ultimate destroyer. But what's interesting about this episode as it unfolds is you really see Tess's thinking because she's going back to the Kawachi Caves and the cave wall with the two-headed monster and how the one head is Naman and the other head is Sagith. They're brothers who become enemies. And it seems in the past that Lex was Sagith or maybe it could have been Lionel, but really it was Lex. But you see, Tess is a different interpretation because Davis Bloom and Clark Kent are from the same planet, well then they're like brothers. And she really gets this into her head. Like when she learns the true origins of Clark Kent, she really does see him as this alien Jesus. I guess I assumed after you ambushed me in my barn and accused me of being an alien Jesus that we had dropped any formalities. And so because she sees him as this alien Jesus, she sort of develops this weird modern alien theology all around him. Who would Christ have been if Judas had not betrayed him? Without Judas, Jesus would have never risen from the dead to come back and face his greatest challenge, saving humankind. And what amazes me about that is it's like, Tess, have you ever picked up a Bible and read it? Jesus' greatest challenge was to resurrect to save humanity? No. Bearing the sins of the world and dying on the cross was his greatest challenge. Rising from the dead was sin and death conquered. It was victory, dear madam. But the point is, is she does develop this incredibly weird theology. So what she believes is in order for Clark to step into his destiny, he must kill his Judas. I have this feeling that you'll never fulfill your great destiny until you meet your greatest challenge. So Oliver Queen is pushing Clark to a ki kill. And when it seems that Clark has his ego in the way, he takes it out of the way by incapacitating Clark. And then you have Tess, who truly believes that Clark must kill to reach his destiny. So she's trying to take away every avenue that he could possibly have so that he 
kills. So she has this mistaken idea of who he is, and rather than getting to know him for who he is, she forces this idea of who he, who she thinks he should be onto him. So even when Clark is trying to get Davis to the Phantom Zone, she sneaks into his barn, takes the crystal that opens the Phantom Zone, and has it destroyed. So that you'd have no choice but to kill the beast. No one has the right to choose who lives and dies. You can't avoid your fate. Therefore, pushing Clark to having to kill Davis. It's very sad and it's very interesting, Tess's character, because, yes, yeah, she's dark. She seems to be on Clark's side. She doesn't want to be an enemy to Clark, but her actions and the way she goes about doing what she does, it is pretty dark and it is pretty evil. So she thinks Clark must be a certain way, so she takes away every avenue to try to force him into her own little box. This is how you have to be, Clark. This is how you have to save the world. You must kill. Why are you so determined to see Davis Bloom die? An entire civilization's survival depends on it. The other thing I find interesting about Tess is that she has this other urgency that is driving her, and it's the orb. There's a voice calling out of the orb, the orb from the end of season seven, the orb Lex was trying to get to the fortress in order to control Clark. Turns out this is also more than that. This orb is Smallville's version of the bottled city of Kandor. And I find that to be incredibly interesting, but this voice calling out to Tess, driving her to drive Clark to get him to destroy Doomsday. That's another element that I find kind of interesting. <laughs> I love how Jimmy Olsen finds Clark incapacitated with the kryptonite arrow in his back. And when Jimmy pulls it away, Clark is fully healed, his powers restored, and Jimmy is vindicated. You were right. About me and about Davis. You were the only person to put it all together. Briefly, because he gets to see that Clark is the blur. And so like his Faith is rewarded, and I'm so happy Jimmy got to see that before this horrendous twist ending that comes, because it turns out Chloe caught on to what Clark was trying to do, and Davis Bloom is a weird, evil guy, okay? He is emotionally holding Chloe hostage. I won't kill Clark if I'm with you. There's something about being around you that seems to calm the murderer inside me. Will you stay with me? it's not gonna change what he was built and designed for. And so it begins to fail, but he holds her emotionally hostage to protect Clark because he's the ultimate doomsday destroyer and he can even kill Clark. So to protect Clark, she must lose Jimmy. She must lose everything and remain with Davis and have a life with him. And so it's this crazy, horrible thing that he does. But Clark holds out hope that it's the monster inside. Can you blame him? When other Kryptonians have come to Earth, they haven't been good. When Chloe was at her most evil, it's when she was possessed completely by Brainiac. Can you blame him for going, yeah, the human side must be the good side, and that Kryptonian side must be the dark side. So Chloe catching onto this plane uses that dark kryptonite. And it separates Doomsday from Davis, and the monster escapes to create destruction and defeats our young Justice League, whose ego was in their way, thinking that they could handle this and trample on Clark's plans, making this even more complicated for Clark Kent. And so Clark does fight the monster. Now, this part is disappointing to me because it's such a buildup, and it's Doomsday! And I'm not just talking Batman vs. Superman. Go back to the 90s when the comic was first written. Check out that two-part animated series, or animated movie, The Death of Superman. Doomsday is epic. The battle is epic, and this battle is a little cheap. But it's because it's not about this physical battle, because it's not even about the physical death of Superman or the Blur or Clark Kent. This is about a different kind of death. So Clark does defeat Doomsday in a fight that is a little bit disappointing and buries him deep down under the earth with all the bombs and all that stuff. And Davis Bloom kills Jimmy Olsen. 
The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? The twist at the end of season 8 is a great illustration of the truth of that verse. Humanity is corrupt. We are not inherently good. We are inherently evil. And Clark saw that on display through Davis Bloom. They separated the beast from the human and the beast was buried deep under the earth. But it was the human that was the true monster. I put humanity on a pedestal. It wasn't the Kryptonian beast that killed Jimmy. It was the human. He said it himself right there. He put humanity up on this pedestal. And even though he knew there was a dark part to humanity, he still seemed to put humanity up on this pedestal. And he was disappointed because his faith was in the wrong thing. Every time Superman fights Doomsday, Superman dies. Smallville does it a little bit different. Instead of a physical death, instead of a literal death, it's more of a figurative death. And instead of Superman dying, it was Clark Kent dying. Clark Kent is dead. All of this that he went through to try to save that human side of Davis, this was his crucible, this was his island, this was his test, but he put his faith in the wrong thing. And so when the human side acted according to its nature, he was disappointed. I was raised to believe it was my Kryptonian part that was dangerous, Chloe, but I was wrong. It's my human side. As long as Davis belonged to that old nature, he was a slave to that old nature. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So what that says is we need something brand new, but it also reveals to us this truth. No matter how much we want to make Clark Kent, our Superman, a Messiah figure, to make him a picture of Jesus, or as they even joke in this season, an alien Jesus, he simply is not because he could only physically save Davis, but he couldn't give Davis a new heart. He couldn't really truly save Davis the man. In fact, there's only one that can, and that's Jesus, the one and only true Messiah. He is the only one that can truly save the human heart. And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they ate off that tree, something died in here. That's where that corruption comes from. And so we need a new nature altogether. And in Christ, we are a new creation. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new spirit. He causes us to be born again. We become something brand new on the inside when we invite him in. And now we have a new nature that we could choose to put on or leave off. And if we leave it off, then we're a slave to that old nature. But when we put on that new nature, that new man that Christ creates inside of us, we have that good destiny. Instead of being a slave to that old nature and to its passions and its desires and to its ultimate destiny, we then become Christ's. And when we become his, we have his destiny and walk in his life. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So season eight is a very interesting season for me, has very interesting symbolism with Doomsday and Davis Bloom and all the stuff there. And they do a great job building Lois and Clark. And just kind of as a final shout out to some of my favorite episodes, this episode Stiletto, simultaneously one of the dumbest episodes of the season and one of the funniest episodes. But the best part is at the end when Lois came up with that superhero stiletto and became stiletto because she really just wanted to interview and talk to the Blur. So he gives her that opportunity, sets up the phone booth where she answers the phone. He's on the cell phone with the voice modulator and he finds that she just wants to be a listening ear and to be there for him and to be a friend to him. And then it strengthens that bond between him and Lois. We're talking to her just feels right. So season eight is jam packed full of all kinds of interesting things. Now, what did you think of season eight? Let's talk about that in the comments. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button to become a Durbanian. Hit that bell by the subscribe button so you're notified for my next Smallville review, movie review, theological review, or anything else I do here. I'm Durbin. Thanks for checking out Durbanian. <laughs>